Today we're going to find out if geometry charts lie. Today we're getting experimental. I have created a device I call the Geometer, and it helps me measure actual geometry of the bikes I have in for review. So today we're going to throw a few bikes on here and measure their actual geometry and compare how that is to the geometry chart posted online. I'm excited. Let's learn something. So first off, why do we even care about geo charts? Well, we use geo charts for a ton of things. We use geometry charts to infer how a bike will ride. We use geo charts to infer how a bike will fit. And we use geo charts to shop for a bike because especially in this day and age with the bike shortage, it's very unlikely that you actually get to throw a leg over the bike you're about to buy, especially if it's a hardtail. So geo charts have become the number one way that people compare bikes online before purchasing. And if that information is inaccurate, then we're making inaccurate purchase decisions. And that's a really important question to answer. This is what I'm calling my geometer. It took me months to design and build this thing. It was painstaking. It looked simple. It was not simple to make for me. So the way it works, we throw a bike in here and these slide along so we can hold it in a static position. And then I'm able to make measurements on here of actual real world geometry This isn't quite as accurate as a frame jig or a $10,000 machine that will actually measure every measurement to the nearest micron, but it's consistent and I'm able to consistently compare bike A to B to C to D when I have it in for review. And my goal is moving forward to put every bike that I review on this geometer to find out what the real geo numbers are to see if they're accurate to the geo chart or not. Sometimes they will be, sometimes they won't even be close. My measurements aren't 100% accurate um, because there's a human involved, but they're as close as I can get and I've replicated them a few times. I put a bike on, measured it, took it off, brought it back on, measured it a little while later and the degrees were accurate within 0.2 degrees and the millimeters were accurate within three millimeters. So I'm gonna give a plus or minus three millimeter, plus or minus 0.2 degree range for my geo measurements. But since they're all getting measured on the same device, I'm gonna be able to be consistent so next up, what I'm gonna do is mark where some of the key features are so that I can measure them. The front axle, the center of the head tube. I'm gonna mark where the bottom bracket is and I'm gonna mark where the rear axle is. This isn't a witch hunt. I'm not out here to call out any companies. I'm here to educate us about whether geocharts are accurate or not. So first up, we're gonna do the reach. Santa Cruz claims this has a 445 mil reach. I get 440, okay? Now Santa Cruz lists the head angle is 65. Now a lot of people will just hold their phone up like this. So if I do this, this says it's a 68 degree head angle using my phone. Let's see how it actually compares. So first up, we're gonna zero this on the tool. This is my Mitutoyo angle finder. Mitutoyo is a friend of the channel. They are awesome. And so I'm gonna measure at the stanchion, 64.4 degrees. That's very different than the 68 I just got on my cell phone. So it's important to make accurate measurements. Let's measure that again, 64.4. So I'm measuring at the stanchion. I might in the future get a jig that will let me measure the actual head tube angle through the head tube but I'm measuring all my bikes through the stanchions right now. So 64.4. Next up is actual seat tube angle. I don't find this to be a very useful number. 71.1 degrees because it bends here and it's not a straight line. So we'll measure effective in a minute, but for some reason people are still caring about actual seat tube angles. And you need to be careful when you're comparing seat tube angles because some geo charts don't call out that it's an effective seat tube angle versus an actual seat tube angle. And there's a huge difference as we're about to see. Now Santa Cruz quotes it as a 74.1. So they must be talking about effective seat tube angle. 74.8. All right, not bad. Now it's time to measure the chainstay length. We've got the dropout slid all the way forward using my favorite tool, my Mitsu Toyo Monster Calipers. I know you guys are fans of this too. All right, this is super accurate. Now remember, chain stays not the same as rear center, but some companies call them the same thing. 
430.0. Now we're gonna measure the rear center, and that is 427. Now it's time to measure stack. So we got a stack of 634 when Santa Cruz said it would be 629. That's within five mil. I have a hunch that Santa Cruz uh, in their CAD file, the fork didn't quite sit this high. It sat a little bit lower, which would account for smaller stack, longer reach, stuff like that. But this is how it fits in reality. Santa Cruz is impressing me. These numbers are right in the ballpark of where I'd expect to see them. Now we're gonna measure the top tube length and the actual top tube length means absolutely nothing to me. Um, because if this were at a different angle, it would change the length of the top tube. I'm getting 610. Now effective top tube, which is a horizontal line to the seat, 620 is the effective top tube. So I'm guessing that's what Santa Cruz is doing is measuring the effective top tube. But depending on how tall your seat is, that's gonna change as well. Now we're gonna measure the bottom bracket drop. 56 mil bottom bracket drop, just like Santa Cruz said, that one's spot on. Now we're gonna measure the front center, which is the bottom bracket to the axle. 758. Awesome, that's within one millimeter of Santa Cruz's measurements. Let's do wheelbase, 1182. All right, let's measure our axle to crown. 535. All right, I'm impressed. Santa Cruz's geo chart looks very similar to my results. I'm guessing the fork that they measured in CAD had a little bit lower axle to crown, but it's very, very close, and I'm gonna call that a win. Nothing really surprised me on this. Now we're gonna throw a few more bikes on here and talk through what we find. So here's my sour crumble. Sorry it's in pieces. I'm in the process of swapping the parts from this frame to another frame for review, but I really wanted to measure this because it rode so different than its geo chart suggested. And it turns out I was right. This geo chart is way off. If you remember in the review, I said this thing rides like it has a much shorter reach, a slacker head angle. It just seems a little bit more playful and a little bit more planted. And sure enough, that was the case. Reach is claimed a 462. And when I reached out to Sauer to order this frame, I said, I think I want a medium, but this seems pretty long for 462. I don't, I don't wanna bump down to the 27.5. Let's try the 29er, but I think it might be long. And when I got it, it did not feel long at all. In fact, it felt compact. Felt a lot like the Santa Cruz Chameleon, a little bit shorter reach. And when I measured it, it came out to 442. Now 20 mil reach difference is significant. That's the difference between a medium size and a large size in most companies. And so if you're sizing just based off this geo chart that's incorrect, you are quite likely to size incorrectly. And that was the whole purpose of this video was to experiment and see just how reliable geo charts are. Some are really reliable, some are spot on, some are not. I don't know why the geo chart is off on this. I don't know if Sauer's trying to hide their secret sauce and their secret geo. I don't know if it was a manufacturing error that the manufacturer goofed and uh, built them to the wrong size. Maybe it was a typo when they were typing it in and they typed the wrong number in there. I'm not sure and I'm not going to assume, but I really wanted to highlight this because the reach is significantly different. The head tube angle was also 0 0.6 degrees slacker than stated and it felt that way. It just felt a little bit more planted on the trail. Chainstay length was spot on. Axle to crown was spot on. So I'm not exactly sure why most of our measurements were pretty close, but the reach was, was way off. And so I'm so glad that I measured this because it opened my eyes to how different the actual geo can be from the chart. This validates me a lot because um, I've been wondering on a lot of these, why did that bike feel so much shorter than another bike? Well, it actually was, and that helps me understand really, really interesting on this. So I'm not trying to call Sour out on the carpet. Who knows why it's inaccurate, but it is inaccurate and I'm sure Sour's not the only one. So all that said, this Sour Crumble is a very special bike. It just doesn't ride like a bike with a 462 mil reach as indicated on the geo chart. Next up is my Banshee Paradox. Now my Banshee Paradox is under forked by 20 mil. The the bike is rated for 120 to 150 mil travel, and I've got mine set to 130 mil travel. And if you look at their geo chart, their geo chart is measured with a 550 mil axle to crown. That's 150 mil travel fork. So when I measured mine at 1, 
30, I expect to see some differences. Um, and there were some, but there were also some discrepancies here as well, some similarities that shouldn't have been. So I'm questioning if their geo chart's a little bit off as well. So with a 150 fork, this should have a 443 mil reach. With a 130 fork, like I write it, it's 460. And that seems like a bigger gap than I would expect to see just dropping the front 20 mil, but, but maybe it's within parameters. Anyway, it does feel like a longer bike with the 130 mil the way I like to ride it. Head tube angle, interestingly enough, was slacker when I underforked it. That doesn't make sense. It should be steeper. So something's a little off there. And here's what's weird. The effective seat tube angle was exactly the same. Under forking it should have steepened the seat angle, not, not kept it the same. So I suspect something's a little bit off on their geo chart. Uh, my chain stay came in a little bit longer, not a huge deal there, but maybe they were talking rear center and that would have been a little closer. But a difference of axle to crown of 20 mil should make a much bigger difference on stack, head angle, and seat angle, and I'm just not seeing that. Anyway, this was interesting regardless, and I do feel like this bike rides longer than its numbers suggest, and a lot of my patron subscribers agree a lot of them who get that end up saying, whoa, I had to run a much shorter stem than I'm used to because this bike really feels stretched out. And especially if you underfork it like I do. Next up, we have the Trek Roscoe. This bike was amazing because it came in within 0.1 degree or one or two millimeters of their geo chart. And that kind of reaffirmed that my measurement process is actually working. Bravo Trek, your geo chart is the most accurate out of all of those that I came across today. And finally, we have the Stanton Sherpa. Now, we're not comparing apples to apples on this one, but I want to highlight the difference between a sagged geometry and actual. So Stanton, um, Pipe Dream, Kodic, a lot of other bikes measure their bikes at sag. And there are pros and cons to that, and I'm not going to get into that today but a lot of other bikes measure at static. And when you type in these geometry calculator websites where they compare bike A to bike B, and you can look at them side to side, they don't usually factor in that one of those is sagged. So your numbers are gonna be way off. So let's show the difference between sagged and actual. When I consult with a lot of people and say, I think the Sherpa would be a great bike for you. They look at the geo chart and say, I don't really want a bike with a 67 degree head angle. That's too steep. And then I remind them that's sagged actual head angle is 65.5. That's quite slack. And so if you don't know that difference between sagged and actual, you're going to be thrown way off on this bike and a lot of others. Reach on a 17 is only 425. That's a lot shorter than 441 when it's sagged. When you remember my review of this bike, I said it felt like it's a little bit tighter in the cockpit. It felt a little bit you don't feel so stretched out. It feels comfortable on long days in the saddle. It just feels a little bit more compact. This is why I struggled to climb up really big ledges on it because the bars were a lot closer to me and I felt that. Seat tube angle came in way slacker. Chain stay was exactly the same. Uh, stack was fairly close. Actual stack was only 11 mil higher. So it's still a lower stack bike, but the stack's higher than you think. Same thing with the Pipe Dream Sirius. It's measured at sag, and the actual stack is significantly higher than the sagged stack. So be careful when comparing those. Um, C tube length was spot on. Bottom bracket drop sagged appears lower than unsagged. So a 40 mil bottom bracket drop unsagged is going to make this bike more poppy, more playful. This is why it manuals so well, despite its longer chain stays, and it's why it feels so great with 27.5 plus tires. And this just really highlights how you really need to know your geometry and pay attention to whether it's sagged or not because it makes all the difference in the world. So I'm not calling Stanton out for having inaccurate geo. They just measure it differently than the other bikes I've mentioned today. And we really need to take that into account. So we make sure we're comparing apples to apples. So we love diving into geometry here, especially on hardtails. It really explains why a bike rides the way that it does. As we saw today, some actual geo numbers do not match the online geo numbers. So we need to be careful when we're comparing bikes back and forth and take that with a grain of salt. So why would a company lie about their geo chart? Well, I don't believe that most companies try to. I think they're just a little bit less than accurate. But I do know some companies really play their cards close to the vest. 
you know, the bike that I designed with binary, we spent 18 months tweaking that design, going back and forth and back and forth. It's been a lot of work. I understand why some bike companies are careful to not publish their exact dimensions because we know people are just gonna go out there and clone it, whether it be another company or an individual. But if you use GeoCharts to do that, consider supporting the person who designed it and help that bike come to fruition. Because if we just clone everything, the people that are designing these great bikes, they're gonna have no motivation or reason to keep pushing the boundary on bikes. It's too bad because geometry charts are intended to be kind of hard, fast science, not up for interpretation or take with a grain of salt. But as we've seen today, some companies have different ways of measuring it. Some people measure rear center instead of chain stay or vice versa. Some people measure actual seat tube angle instead of effective seat tube angle. And if you don't know all that stuff, you can easily get turned around and make bad inferences based on the information that you have. If you need help deciding which bike to buy and you wanna pick my brain comparing bike A to bike B, I do my bike consultation over on Patreon. I would love to help you over there if that's something you're interested in, sign up. If not, feel free to keep enjoying my free videos. Thanks for getting experimental with me today. I'm curious, have you ever found a geometry discrepancy or which frame do you think is going to measure differently than its geo chart when I get it in? Love to hear your comments below. Thanks for watching. There's a party in the mountains and you're invited. Yeah.